Sonic, the heart of your system. Hi and welcome to a new video. As you can see on my table, we are going to take a closer look at a 5700 XT. In detail, it's going to be the Power Color 5700 XT Liquid Devil. Most of you are very familiar or will be familiar with the 5700 XT Red Devil, which is a very good card. It has a very good cooler, a good PCB, especially um, regarding the price, comparing it with the price of a normal AMD reference design, which is something I wouldn't really recommend if you're going for a 5700 XT. But this this card is 600 euro, at least if you want to buy it here in Germany. Depends on your location. US should be also about 600 USD. So it's not the cheapest card. We're going to take a look at this card and see if it's worth it. The PowerColor 5700 XT Liquid Devil is basically a Red Devil card, but instead of getting a still quite good air cooling unit, you're getting an EK full cover block. And you could argue that you can just get any kind of 5700 XT and equip it with an EK full cover block, which are typically available for about 130 euro. But then you can only get that for the reference card. And the reference PCB is much worse, or it's worse than the 5700 XT Red Devil or Liquid Devil. Um, this PCB is different, it has 10 phases instead of 7 phases. We will take a closer look at this later when we disassemble the card, going to take a closer look at the full cover block. Um, my priority will especially be how is this thing assembled, um, just the quality when it comes to like thermal pads and uh, thermal paste, just to see if it's worth that you pay a premium price to get this uh, thing pre-assembled versus buying a 5700 XT uh, like reference design and equipping it with your own water cooler like buying an EK water blocks full cover block um, but if you by this combination you get um, a card that's already equipped with the water cooler you get it with warranty so that's kind of a benefit um, but the question is is it really worth it because this card is 600 euro which is obviously fairly a lot so that's a pure enthusiast product. Um, if we compare this to like just a reference card, um, one of the main features is that we have this BIOS switch in the front which lets you decide between the Unleashed and also the OC BIOS. From my personal perspective and opinion it's a little bit confusing to have like Unleashed and OC. Typically I would more, more like to refer to something like a normal mode and then OC mode because OC is kind of overclocking and not normal. That's why I, when I first uh, tested the card, first time used it, I was not really sure um, which setting is basically the factory setting and then read the review guide um, I got from PowerColor, um, said that the OC BIOS, basically having the switch in this direction, having it pointed towards the power connectors, the OC BIOS, that's the factory BIOS, which comes with a 230 watt power limit. And if you flip the switch in this direction to Unleashed, uh, it's going to be 270 watt uh, power consumption or TDP um, or power target. And the question is, um, is it really worth it? And what is going to change if you just flip the BIOS switch, if you just allow the card to pull more power and how is this going to affect the clock? We performed about 15 different benchmarks in different resolutions to get an impression what the different BIOS versions will do, what the impact will be. For example, if we take a look at Firestrike, Firestrike Extreme and Ultra, the difference is really, really small. We're talking about 10 to 15 megahertz higher uh, GPU clock by flipping the switch towards uh, the unleashed direction. But if we run Fermark, for example, in Fermark we achieved about 100 to 120 megahertz higher clocks by running um, the unleashed BIOS. So in Fermark, it's ex extremely synthetic and high load. It seems to be worth it. Um, but most of the time in the other synthetic benchmarks like in Heaven or Superposition, doesn't really change that much if, you, if we flip the switch to the unleashed BIOS. But if we perform a manual overclocking, this card can really hit some very nice clocks. PowerColor communicated in the review guide that this card comes with a specially binned GPU. And personally, I'm really um, reserved when it comes to this kind of communication from the marketing side. Um, if there is really a binned GPU, and even if there is a binned GPU, I'm typically not sure um, how much of a difference it really makes um, instead of just getting a normal sample and overclock it yourself. Um, this card certainly is above average for the other 5700 XTs I've tested, um, but it's also not the best card I've ever tested. And I also have to keep in mind that all the other cards I tested so far were all air-cooled. And typically, obviously, this GPU will be 20 degrees Celsius colder. Therefore, 
potentially clocking 10, 20 megahertz higher. So you can always get like a wrong impression um, if this card is really much better um, versus like a Red Devil or versus like uh, any other 5700 XT. But I can say at least this sample is clocking above average versus other 5700 XTs I've tested. If we take a look at several different benchmarks like Fire Strike, Final Fantasy, Superposition, the card always clocks um, about 2100 to 2150 megahertz uh, peak. That's what a card can typically do in all those different benchmarks. Um, like Fermark is more in the direction of 2100. Whereas for example in Heaven Extreme benchmark the card clocked at 2154 megahertz. So obviously there's always a variation um, when it also comes to like power consumption. But in general I can say the card um, for me is clocking above average. Okay, so I would say let's just um, go ahead and uh, disassemble this card, take a look at the quality of assembly of uh, this specific sample. Let's see how much you get for 600 euro. Teardown time, in general it's a pretty normal EK design, so intake here, uh, water is spread over this jet plate down there, uh, typical very uh, thin fin design. Then going through here, I think underneath there is the area where the VRM is cooled, and then to the outtake, EK logo here. Power color liquid devil right there and if we turn it around you can see the card is equipped with a nice backplate in power color design. As we can see, the backplate is not only for visual purpose, but also has a cooling aspect. We can see there's a very thin thermal pad right here, which makes contact with the VRM. The VRM is sitting in this area. You can see some residues of the thermal pad, which is uh, pretty normal. Um, there is no thermal pad underneath the GPU, which is totally, totally fine. In some German communities, there is the myth that heat gets stuck underneath um, the back blade and it's like trapped in between here but that really makes no sense because a water cooler is sufficient to remove all kind of heat that's dissipated from either um, GPU memories or the VRM. Card removed we can see the beauty of the EK water block um, we have the VRM part on the left, this part makes contact um, with the inductors and the left part here where the thermal pad is stuck on the card makes contact with the MOSFETs themselves. What I really like is the fact that the thermal pads are really thin, so those should be like 0.5 millimeter and I think this one is like 1 millimeter, but it's really really thin thermal pad, therefore the thermal performance of the pads is much better or the thermal resistance is much lower then comparing it to like two or three millimeter pads, which I've seen on some graphics cards lately. In the middle, we see a good thermal paste spread and contact to the GPU. What's kind of interesting is that this is not one block, but it's made out of two smaller individual parts, which is surely to keep the production cost of this block low. But talking about um, the VRM cooling performance and memory cooling performance, let's quickly take a look at temperature results. The GPU was always running really cold, but it mainly also depends on your cooling solution. I was running this with a 360 radiator and a DDC pump. In most of the synthetic benchmarks, the card would always run between 40 and 44 uh, degree Celsius. Only in Fermark, obviously, because this is really heavy, card peaked out at 48 degrees Celsius. If we read out the GPU temp hotspot, um, it was typically around 60 degrees Celsius max in the synthetic benchmarks and up to 70 degrees Celsius uh, during Fermark. Memory temperature typically between 50 and 55 degrees Celsius, so also the memory was uh, quite cold and VRM temperature in any condition always between uh, 45 and 50 degrees Celsius so also VRM temperature was really really cool. The card itself as I said before is pretty much the 5700 XT Red Devil. Um, yeah don't get confused by this um, mess here on the thermal paste that was me by accident when I just removed uh, the water cooler so don't just ignore this part here. Uh, the thermal paste application in general is really good. The thermal paste is still uh, wet and soft so nothing dried out. Also the amount of thermal paste is really really nice. It's pretty much the perfect amount, not too less, not too much. Um, thermal pads, as I said before, very nice uh, choice. They're quite thin which also explains the good temperatures on this card. Otherwise this PCB is, as I said before, identical to the Red Devil. Um, has a 10-phase design 
which is pretty much sufficient for anything you would do with a 5700 XT. So any kind of overclocking uh, should be no problem uh, with this PCB. Also, you have the BIOS switch on here. So much about the PCB and let's get to the conclusion. Let's get to the summary about the 5700 XT Liquid Devil. In general, it's a great card from a technical perspective, um, but let's talk about the price. Um, you get a uh, water cool 5700 XT for 600 euro. For 600 euro, um, it's, it sounds quite a lot, but if you decide or if you always wanted to have a 5700 XT water cooled, um, your only option is pretty much to get a different card, um, like a reference design card, which is like 400, 410 euro. And then you have to invest about 130 euro for the water cooler. Uh, you don't um, get this special design. So you end up with like 540 to maybe maximum 550 euro if you decide to get a 5700 XT and water cool it yourself. Now you pay 50 euro more for this card. Um, there is an EK die kit included. So like um, concentrate for your water fluid. I think it's red yellow and blue that's included in the kit. Um, I think Parkour should have went without this kit and make this card 20 euro cheaper. That would be even better. Um, but keeping in mind that this kit is included, um, this card is 50 euro more expensive than getting a 5700 XTU and water cool it yourself. In this regard, I think it's fine because you get a very good PCB, you get like a unique design and uh, you have warranty. You don't have to disassemble, assemble the card yourself, have like risk of damaging something. In this regard, I think it's okay to pay 50 euro more, but you would have to decide if it's really worth to spend 600 euro on in the end, just a 5700 XT instead of going for like 2080. But if you're a big fan of 5700 XT, technically it's okay. And it's a very good card. Technically I can recommend it. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time. Bye.